Welcome to another edition of Who's Number One. I'm Trey Wingo. So many names, the squared circle, the sweet science. No matter what you call it, this show is dedicated to the guys who practice it. Some are crafty, some are courageous, some simply brutal, some bleed a lot. But all of them the best in the sport of boxing. So come out and shake hands and let's get ready to present ESPN Classics 20 Best Boxers of All Time. 20, 20. I love Larry Holmes. When I was a kid, Larry Holmes was the heavyweight champion of the world. He is underrated and underappreciated. The Eastern Assassin. He was a great guy to watch fight. And he used to, by the way, fight on network TV, and it was an event, not a Muhammad Ali level event, not an event that a Mike Tyson fight would be later, but it was the heavyweight champion fighting. Larry Holmes had a jackhammer jab that was, for all its brutality, somehow a thing of beauty. He was an artist with his fists. He won 69 of 75 fights, including his first 48. Holmes defeated such power punchers as Ken Norton and Leon Spinks, held the heavyweight title for seven years, and continued to fight even after becoming AARP eligible. But his place in history is still debated. He didn't get the respect he deserved because he followed someone who called himself the greatest, Muhammad Ali. And people were angry that he was the one who uh, kind of put him into retirement. I'm sorry that I can't be a Muhammad Ali or a Joe Lewis or Leon Spinks, but I wasn't born to be those people. I was born to be myself, Larry Holmes. He was a great fighter. I'm glad he made the list. He deserves it. 19. Julio Cesar Chavez will go down as the, one of the all-time greats. Uh, from Culiacan, Mexico, he was brought up tough. He was brought up fighting in the streets. His numbers are gaudy and argue forcefully for the raw brilliance of Julio Cesar Chavez. A streak of 87 straight victories to start his career and 108 wins in all. The Mexican Mauler held world titles in three weight classes. There was no tougher man than Julio Cesar Chavez. He would take two punches to land one. It was, in fact, a, an urban legend that on a CAT scan they saw that his skull was actually thicker than the common man's because he could take more punishment. Just a tough little SOB. I mean, he never took a back step. He was real consistent. That's a quality. You know, it's not just speed, footwork, and punch and power, and a good shin. It's being reliable. He wasn't flashy. You know, he wasn't sensational in one area. But he was very good in all areas. Greg Holland once said Julio Cesar Chavez fought more Mexican cab drivers in the history of anybody in the world. And then he went and fought Chavez, and he got beaten to a pulp. And after, he said, OK, so they were tough cab drivers. He was uh, probably the greatest Mexican fighter ever. Presenting the undefeated, undisputed heavyweight champion of the world, Evander Real Deal Holyfield. Evander Holyfield is one of the toughest human beings in the history of the planet. If you fought Evander Holyfield, you are going through hell. Evander Holyfield has no fear of no man, ever. He never will, he never has. Persistent to a fault, Evander Holyfield became the first heavyweight to win the title four times. His warrior's refusal to quit has been both his strength and vulnerability. His biography will be highlighted by his two victories over Mike Tyson, especially the controversial second bout. It's a shame that a guy who was such a great champion for so long will probably be known as the guy who got his ear bitten off by Mike Tyson. But Evander Holyfield outboxed Tyson, outboxed the people of his day, and really is a dominant champion when you look at the annals of heavyweight fighting for an awfully long period of time. Holyfield's valor shone brightly in his shattering trilogy with Riddick Bowe. If you're gonna make a movie of the way you think a heavyweight fight should go, that'd be the one you'd take. The champion is hurt, and he is down! 
He cannot stop it. Riddick Bowe has got the champion almost out of his feet. Here were two really tough guys. Holyfield, what a warrior, what a champion. He comes back to the right of his own. This event of Holyfield is something to behold. And at the end of the day, Bo wins in what was really considered an upset at the time, but it was also the first of what would turn out to be three very good fights. 17. 17. Gene Tunney's a smooth, smooth fighter. You want to see a guy who can box, uh, you, you know, you'd look at Gene Tunney for a heavyweight. He fought in the Marines. He was a well-schooled fighter. He was really a poised, experienced, savvy fighter. In his 63-fight career, Gene Tunney suffered only one defeat, and that was as a light heavyweight. The fighting Marine was heavyweight champ from 1926 to 1928. Gene Tunney is this largely forgotten figure, despite the fact that he won the biggest fight in the history of fights. He beat the idol of America, Jack Dempsey, and America held it against him. Most people thought that Jack Dempsey would run right through Gene Tunney. Tunney just outfought him. Tunney was the better fighter in the sense of boxing. And then they fought again, I think it was in 27. Tunney beat him again. In their rematch, Dempsey knocked Tunney down in the seventh round. But taking advantage of a delayed 10 count, Tunney was able to get on his feet and go on to win what has become known as the long count. He's still not considered the equal of Jack Dempsey, whom he beat twice, fair and square. He retired as the heavyweight champion of the world. Not many people do that. He deserves a lot more credit than he gets. Mike Tyson was a force of nature. He delivered what people like to see, knockout punches. Early in his career, when he was at his best, he was probably the most captivating fighter to watch, save for Muhammad Ali, in boxing. In the 1980s, I thought we were looking at a 10 to 15 year reign for Mike Tyson, and I didn't see how anybody could possibly beat him. On November 22, 1986, at the age of 20, Mike Tyson became the youngest heavyweight champion ever. A product of the mean streets of Brooklyn, he fought with an uncageable fury and seemed to be invincible until he met a 42 to 1 underdog named Buster Douglas. Tyson, we never expect to see this. Does he know where he is? We get a new heavyweight champion. We have a new heavyweight champion. When finally he started to fight fighters his own size, at least in terms of skill level, uh, suddenly he became fairly pedestrian. He fought Vander Holyfield, he got beat once, he quit the other time. He fought Lennox Lewis, he got knocked out. Somewhere in, in his head, the switch went off and he was no longer a professional fighter. I tend to think that history's not gonna treat Mike Tyson well. Mike Tyson, the force of nature, was not Mike Tyson, the great heavyweight fighter everyone thought he was. Roberto Duran was lightweight champion of the world for seven years in probably the greatest era of boxing, the 1970s. He was definitely the greatest lightweight I ever saw, and many people will tell you he's the greatest lightweight of all time. Known as the Hands of Stone, resilient Roberto Duran began fighting in the 60s and continued into the 21st century, piling up 106 wins. Fighting against the likes of Tommy Hearns and Marvin Hagler, the Panamanian won four world titles from lightweight to middleweight. He wore his opponents down with a merciless two-fisted attack. Roberto Duran was never given credit, really, for being as great a boxer as he was. And Duran hurt him again, and Herbert is going down. Very slick, tough to hit, rolling with punches extremely well. He was always tough, 
but he relied more on his toughness than his boxing skills as his career went on. Moran with two good quick lefts and a third left. He thinks he's got the fight in the bag. Roberto Duran beat Sugar Ray Leonard at welterweight, which was, you know, unheard of. Uh, in Leonard's prime, at Leonard's best weight. Beat him, no excuses. So that's probably his greatest accomplishment. Roberto Duran is the new WBC welterweight champion of the world. It was the only time that Leonard actually was outsmarted by somebody, and that was Roberto Duran. When it came to the complete package, a guy who could hit hard, a guy who could avoid getting hit, I don't think there's many fighters in the history of boxing better than Roberto Duran. Roy Jones Jr. was a terrifically skilled fighter. I've never seen a fighter with as much talent ever as Roy Jones. Problem was, he fought in a division that nobody knew about or cared about, and at the end of the day, there were not a whole lot of uh, opponents for him. Roy Jones Jr. began as a middleweight, grew into a light heavyweight, and held that title for seven years. He won 48 of his first 49 bouts, frequently toying with an overmatched opponent. But there continues to be disagreement about where he ranks in the roll call of the greatest. If you could magically put Roy Jones Jr. in the ring with anybody from any era, who beats him at middleweight? Who? To become a great, to become Roberto Duran, to become a Muhammad Ali, to become a Sugar Ray Robinson, to become a Sugar Leonard, you have to have that extra something. And he was never put in the position to do that. He beat Bernard Hopkins and he beat James Tony, and 15 years later, those wins were better than ever. He never showed he was great. He, he showed he was starting to be great, but he didn't wind up that way. He was never tested, so we can never put him up there in the top 10 greatest of all times because of that. March 17th, 1950, entering the Garden Ring is featherweight champion Willie Pep. Willie Pep was the greatest featherweight of all time. He was untouchable, beat everybody, hardly ever lost a round, let alone a fight. He's only been beaten four times in those 150 professional fights he did. Will of the Wisp, you know, so Willie Pep, he hit retired 230 wins, 11 losses. Willie Pep is an authentic 20-year man of boxing. Willie had that natural ability in the ring. It wasn't taught. He had it. Willie Pep, the boxing, and in this case, the dancing master. You couldn't hit Pep. Didn't, wasn't a big puncher, but you couldn't hit him. Great footwork, Willie Pep. I mean, he could go rounds without getting touched. Willie Pep is still the featherweight champion of the world. Greatest boxer you've ever seen. Willie Pep made defense an art form. He was cobra quick and slick of foot, and in 1945, fought an entire round without throwing a punch, and won anyway, just as he had predicted. Wee Willie didn't suffer his first loss until his 64th fight. Among his most memorable bouts were the four with Sandy Sadler. He was in a plane crash and was lucky to survive, let alone fight again. So he fights Sandy Sadler after the plane crash. Well, he pet with that jabbing, spearing left hand. And those guys were so dirty, thumbing each other in the eye, head-butting, rabbit-punching, growing shots. Sadler beat Pep three out of four. But Pep won the second fight. It was the greatest piece of boxing I've ever seen. Pep was the master of masters when it just came to uh, the art of self-defense. Willie Pep, one of the great little men of all time. He's a small guy, but he, he was a great fighter. 12, 12. Probably no fighter has traveled the miles as Archie Moore traveled. When he was at his prime, you didn't have to fight black fighters if you didn't want to fight them. Archie Moore got ducked probably more than, uh, than almost anybody who ever fought. All I wanted was fights. I didn't give a damn who I fought. When his time came, he was way past what is normally a boxer's prime. The one thing you remember about Archie Moore is his longevity. Although held back by racism, Archie Moore managed to make up for lost time, winning 194 fights, 141 by knockout, in a 28-year career. 
The old mongoose started fighting professionally in 1935, but it wasn't until 17 years later, at age 39, that he seized his first world title. He successfully defended that light heavyweight crown for eight and a half years. Boris Chimor is the only heavyweight in history that fought Rocky Marciano and Muhammad Ali. Archie Moore had one of the great fights of all time with Ivan Durrell when he was like 44 years old and Durrell was in his 20s. I don't think anybody thought Archie Moore was going to survive the fight. Once the Archie Moore fight with Durrell took place, everybody understood now a fight is not over until it's over. Up that nine bucks dagger. He roared back, figured out Durrell, and finally knocked him out in the 11th round. Struggling at nine, ten, he is out! get off the floor the way he did, but then knock out Durrell. It was something to behold. You're not going to fight 200 professional fights and not have the heart of a champion. 11, 11, 11. If you're looking for the 20 toughest guys, uh, whoever boxed, you don't have to get too far past first place to find Joe Frazier. Frazier was fast and hard and relentless. To watch Joe Frazier in his prime is like watching a machine, is like watching an embodiment of the human will. Smoking Joe Frazier knew only one gear, forward. With a left hook that could topple a redwood, he compiled a record of 32-4-1, losing only to Muhammad Ali and George Foreman. Frazier, who won the heavyweight title in 1970, would fight his greatest rival Ali on the greatest stage in the fight of the century. Joe Frazier won that fight, and, you know, he threw that great left hook at the end to drop Muhammad Ali, and no one could believe it. It was as if I and, and my generation had taken a punch to the solar plexus. After Ali had beaten Frazier in their second fight, they met on October 1st, 1975, in the Thrilla in Manila. Well, let's not call it a fight, let's call it a war, because it was a war. Two old warriors are going at it, and they inflicted a lot of damage on each other that night. It's been a super fight all the way here in the Philippine Coliseum. They gave every inch of their beings in that fight. They gave every ounce of their souls. The legend of Muhammad Ali would be greatly diminished had there never been a Joe Frazier. In their three fights, he really brought Ali to the uh, ultimate level. As great as Ali was, there was something that he could not turn away, and that was Joe Frazier's will. Frazier's will was going to be imposed upon you, and in his prime, he was miraculous to watch. Ten, ten, ten. George Warmer is interesting because he had two lives. His first reign was a reign of terror, and he was probably the most frightening heavyweight champion of all time. When Ali went to Zaire to fight him, people were literally afraid that George Foreman was going to kill Muhammad Ali. When he got the rope-a-dope from Muhammad Ali, the persona was shattered, and George's career basically was shattered, and he never thought you were going to see George Foreman again. During big George Foreman's two-part career, he punched out a record of 76-5 and five with 68 knockouts. He won the heavyweight title as a bully by destroying Joe Frazier in 1973, but lost it the next year to Muhammad Ali. Reformed and remade as everyone's favorite uncle 20 years later, Foreman fought Michael Moore for the title. The pre-fight hype gave George Foreman no chance. And for the first eight or nine rounds, it was a pretty serious beating that Michael Moore gave George Foreman. Solid right hand by Moore. Foreman's left eye beginning to close. And yet, all it takes is one big right hand from George Foreman, and it's over. Down goes Moore on a right hand. It happened. It happened. The fact that he actually won the real heavyweight championship of the world at the age of 45 is one of the most remarkable achievements in all of sports. Marvin Hagler, this guy came up in the streets. He came up hungry. He knocked everybody out that he fought during his title reign, except for Roberto Duran. If you wanted to pay your money to see a man fight, you wanted to see Marvin Hagler. Phone booth or freeway, marvelous Marvin Hagler would fight anywhere. 
He became middleweight champ in 1980 and successfully defended the title a dozen times. Hagler retired after a controversial loss to Sugar Ray Leonard with a 62-3-2 record, highlighted by a slugfest with Thomas Hearns. Tremendous pace in the first round. Well, Hagler Hearns is a fan favorite because it's so savage and it's so fast, and then it's over pretty quickly. Hearns getting the better of it right now. Right from the opening bell, these guys delivered in a way that you seldom see. Hagler punishing Hearns. I don't think that either one of us really thought we just fought. This is still the first round. Tommy was the type of person that tried not to back up. I had to back him up. Hagler goes in for the kill. You coming in here saying that you're going to take my title and knock my ball head off. You got to be dreaming. It's over. Oh, this one is history. Over. Marvin Hagler, a tremendous victory. Hagler had never quite gotten his due and I think with that knockout people realized this is not just a middleweight champ this is an all-time great eight. Eight, eight, eight. Sugar Ray Leonard may have been the street smartest boxing savviest fighter I ever covered he just knew how to play the game Leonard's genius, I think, was dictating the rules of engagement. He was going to fight when he wanted to fight. He was not going to fight and exchange when you wanted to exchange. I think he, in many ways, was the smartest fighter of all time. Sugar Ray Leonard could charm you with that megawatt smile or flatten you with his right hand. The 1976 Olympic gold medalist had charisma and pop winning titles in five divisions and 36 of 40 bouts. Among those he beat, Roberto Duran, Marvelous Marvin Hagler, and Thomas Hearns. Ray Leonard, the perception was he was the pretty boy from the Olympics, good boxer. How tough was he? Well, we're about to find out. You're in the ring with Tommy Hearns. He's six foot two. 78 inch reach, not much shorter than Larry Holmes' reach or Muhammad Ali's reach. He's a welterweight, can hit you from across the ring. By the way, he can outbox you and he can turn out the lights with one punch. I was scared for Sugar Ray Leonard. Until it ended, you had no idea who was going to win. I think he would beat almost anybody pound for pound in the history of the sport eventually because I think he was smart enough to figure out what you did and what would work against that. Seven, seven, seven. Jack Johnson was a legend. He went against the system. He was revolutionary. Once he got the chance, Jack Johnson became the first black heavyweight champion in history, winning the title in Australia. To the chagrin of the white establishment, he held the crown for six and a half years until losing it to Jess Willard in Cuba in 1915. Johnson flaunted convention at a time when racism was rampant. First of all, in order to win the heavyweight title, he had to prove himself the best among a group of black heavyweights who were avoided by the white fighters of the day. They drew the color line. He had chased Tommy Burns around the world to fight Tommy Burns for the title, which he won on Christmas Day in 1908. He was one of the few fighters in that era who was really able to fight everybody and proved himself the best. Jack Johnson drove the white establishment nuts. He was cocky, he was arrogant, he was everything that would give white America a stroke. Johnson had taunted opponents, been flamboyant, had openly gone around with white women, things which were resented by white America at that time. In terms of his social impact, he was at least half a century ahead of his time. In other words, if it was a half a century later when he came around, he'd still be totally cutting edge. Unfortunately, the way he comported himself, there wasn't another guy getting a shot until Joe Lewis came along. Six, six, six. Henry Armstrong was a three division champion when there were no junior weight classes and would fight anybody. Armstrong belongs to a long line of champions and tonight he's boxing better than ever. He could do everything in a boxing ring. You wanted a box, he could outbox you. You wanted a brawl, he could outbrawl you. Boring in with his head down, hardly ever giving the other fellow a chance of hitting out. If there was no such thing as Sugar Ray Robinson, Armstrong would be the greatest fighter of all time. In fact, as long as Henry's in the ring, Ernie Jump can't keep out of arm's way. If he wasn't the greatest, you don't have to get too far down the list to find his name. Henry Armstrong. 
Even though he lost three of his first four pro fights, versatile Henry Armstrong retired in 1945 with 151 wins. In 1937 alone, he had a career going 27-0, 26 by knockout. Homicide Hank's the only fighter to hold titles in three divisions simultaneously. God, he was good. Uh, he was nonstop. Busy, busy, busy. It was a different era. It was an era when uh, guys would come out every week, every two weeks, and fight and defend their titles. He was a lightweight who was good enough to clean out that division and win the title. Drop down to featherweight to win that title, and then move up to welterweight to win that title and make 18, 19 defenses in like two and a half years. Nobody accomplished more than Henry Armstrong. Five, five, five. There was no greater draw in America in sports than Jack Dempsey. He fought for money when he was 16 and found he had the aptitude for it. Jack Dempsey threw lightning bolt punches, knocking out some foes in less than 20 seconds. The heavyweight champ from 1919 to 1926, the Manassa Mauler was one of the marquee names in the golden age of sport. Jack Dempsey represented a whole new era, and he comes in like a pit bull. He crouches low, his hair is shaved off the back of his head, he's got this scowl, and he's out to kill his opponent. He had that ducking lower style, he was a swarmer, he was an attacker, they called him the tiger. Jack Dempsey was this human wrecking machine who had torn everyone he had fought to shreds. This excited the country. I mean, the country had just come out of the war. They wanted heroes, and boy, they loved Jack Dempsey. He had a great way about him, the rugged look. He turned people on. That's why he was such an attraction. Nothing personified being hard and being able to overcome and be successful more than Jack Dempsey. The only thing with Dempsey, he didn't fight enough. When he won the title, he didn't fight for three years. And he wouldn't fight black men, which was ridiculous. So that's got to take some points off him. He was such a huge figure uh, in America. He continued to be a legendary figure, you know, right up till the day he died. Four. Four. You talk about desire. You talk about doing anything to win. That was Rocky Marciano. Tough as a rock. He was very well named. It was like going up against granite. He was relentless. The bell would ring, he would be on you. The bell ring, he'd stop. The bell would ring, he would be right back on you. He just kept coming and throwing that dreadful overhand right that just hammered everybody into submission. In a violently imperfect sport, Rocky Marciano was perfect. He was never beaten. The only champion in any class to retire undefeated with a 49-0 career record. He ruled the heavyweights, beating luminaries as Ezard Charles and Archie Moore. And Jersey Joe Walcott, who Rocky knocked out with the greatest punch in boxing history. Marciano trained like an old-time bare-knuckle fighter. He had the endurance to go 20 rounds. He could knock you out in the 20th round. He had to train. He had to be in better shape than his opponent, otherwise he wasn't going to win, and he knew that. Based on just skill and natural speed and strength, he wasn't going to beat the top heavyweights. So he had to work that hard. In 1951, Marciano fought his idol, the aging Joe Lewis. After knocking out his mentor in the eighth round of a non-title fight, Marciano was reduced to tears of remorse and guilt. Afterwards, you know, you could almost feel all the kind of the power draining out of Marciano. It was almost the sense of him saying, I'm sorry, Joe. He never lost a fight, never lost a fight. Not even to his wife, which is what he always used to say. <laughs> I don't really look at the 49 and 0 so much. I look at who he beat. Bottom line, he beat good contenders like Lestarza, and he beat Joe Walcott and Archie Moore in fights where he deserves full credit for really beating those guys. Anybody wants to argue about Rocky Marciano, just look at the record, 49 and 0. If you ask God, build me a fighter, he would build Sugar Ray Robinson, which is what he did. His athletic ability was so superior to every fighter he fought. He was a wizard in the ring. His hands moved like lightning. He was like a gazelle. 
It was like watching a ballet. You would never know the other guy was in the ring when he was there. Walker Smith Jr. was so adept at the sweet science that he became known as Sugar Ray Robinson, welterweight champ and five times middleweight king. Satin smooth, he amassed 175 wins and was accorded the sport's ultimate compliment. Ray Robinson could do everything. Knock you out, back and up. Ask Gene Fool. A choking left hook by Robinson and Gene Fool now crashes to the canvas. That was Ray Robinson. You want a box? We'll box 100 rounds. You'll never, ever touch me. Robinson engaged in brutal wars with Carmen Basilio and Gene Fulmer, and in a six-fight savagery with the raging bull Jake LaMotta that concluded with the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. That fight was great because you had the bull Jake LaMotta, who had beaten Robinson once. LaMotta was the only man to beat him in his first 123 fights. 123 fights? I mean, fighters today don't even have 123 fights. You saw, you saw one man not giving up, trying his damnedest to catch Sugar Ray Robinson. And Sugar Ray Robinson toying with him at, at times. No man can endure this tunnel. The fight is going to be stopped on a signal. I say I'm the greatest heavyweight of all time, but pound for pound, I still say Sugar Ray Robinson was the greatest of all time. And the new world middleweight boxing champion, Sugar Ray Robinson! Greatest fighter, pound for pound, that ever lived. There's no question about it. Joe Lewis was the greatest phenomenon the ring had ever seen. Joe Lewis with the Green Hornet, Superman, Batman, Dick Tracy, all these people rolled into one for African Americans. He had this tremendous burden that he had to carry. He had to follow a pretty strict code of how to comport himself in public and how to talk about his opponent. He had to worry about a lot of things that most fighters never ever had to worry about. He understood his role in terms of breaking down the barriers in this country. Some fighter do they talk to me before they get in the ring. I do my when I get in the ring with my fist. On top of all the social significance of him being on top as a black man being the heavyweight champion of the world, he dominated the sport that was considered the singular sport. Joe Lewis knocked down opponents and knocked down social barriers with equal facility. He held the heavyweight title from 1937 to 1949, successfully defending it a record 25 times. In all, the Brown Bomber won 68 of 71 bouts. On June 22nd, 1938, he met Max Schmeling in a rematch with unprecedented implications. I'm going to be in the best of shape, and I'm sure they're going to be a very good fight. It was not a boxing match at all. It was a fight about two systems of government, two ways the world was going to go the Nazis and the American way. Nobody was going to beat him that night. And he came out so sure of himself. And he gave that German such a shellacking. The fight is over. Max Schmeling is beaten in one round. Put him in a hospital for a week. At that moment, it felt like Joe had knocked out Hitler. Joe Lewis was the hero of the hour, not just to black America, but to all America. Welcome back to Who's Number One and the 20 Best Boxers of All Time. Let's recount with the recap. Larry Holmes. 19. Julio Cesar Chavez. 18. Evander Holyfield. Gene Tunney. 16. Mike Tyson. 15. Roberto Duran. 14. Roy Jones Jr. 13. Willie Pep. 12. Archie Moore. Joe Frazier. Ten. 
George Foreman. Nine. Marvelous Marvin Hagler. Eight. Sugar Ray Leonard. Seven. Jack Johnson. Six. Henry Armstrong. Jack Dempsey. Four. Rocky Marciano. Three. Sugar Ray Robinson. Two. Joe Lewis. If you want to break it down, hit and don't get hit. That, in essence, is boxing. All the great ones could and can, but one did it with uncommon grace and style. This one, our number one. One, one. Cassius is not my name no more. Officially Muhammad Ali now. Muhammad Ali, right, Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali is a great fighter. Muhammad Ali turned out to be a great man who could move like a lightweight, punch like a heavyweight. I mean, he had everything. There was no such thing as trash talking until Ali showed up. I'm handsome, I'm bad, I'm pretty, and can't possibly be beat. He put on a show before the fight, he put on a show during it, and after it, he was even better. He changed the way athletes acted with the media and the way the media treated athletes. I'm the greatest. I'm knocking out all bones. And if you get too smart, I'll knock you out. Ali was also a controversial figure. Despite being a fighter by trade, Ali was a man of peace. He boycotted the Vietnam War only to be stripped of his title and banned from boxing. I will not go 10,000 miles to help murder another poor people. What happens now to his title? He will doubtless be stripped of it by every state boxing commission in this country and by the World Boxing Association. He was able to come back from that three and a half year absence and then later pull off one of the great upsets in boxing history, knocking out George Foreman. After knocking out Foreman, Ali fought Joe Frazier a third time in the epic thriller in Manila. That victory secured Ali's place not only in fistic history, but as a man who was once reviled and then came to be admired for his convictions and the courage to stand behind him. If you had told somebody in 1968 that in 1996 Muhammad Ali would be the most beloved individual on earth and the mere sight of him holding an Olympic torch would bring people to tears, you'd won a lot of bets. As a cultural icon, certainly he was more important than any other athlete. Muhammad Ali is the greatest fighter of all time. So there they are, our 20 most adept engineers of the sweet science. And here they are, our second guessers. Boxing maven Burt, standing eight count sugar, and sports historian Nick, I forgot to duck Akachella. Remember, fellas, mouthpiece out, then speak. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Ali's, I gotta tell you. He was classic, he was great, but in ways he wasn't classic. He held his hands low, he never went to the body, he didn't have a one-punch knockout punch except maybe in the Cleveland Williams mm -hmm. fight. Mm -hmm. And instead of bobbing and weaving, he pulled his head straight back, so the only reason he got away with everything was he was faster than fast. And he also, he makes all of these lists near the, near the top or at the top because he became such a seminal figure in, in world culture. For, for reasons having nothing to do with his athletic ability, he gets to the top of these lists. He's the most famous person in the world at one time. And I don't want to tell you something about writers, but we tend to be emulative. We tend to imitate. And once he started calling himself the greatest guest... Of course, writer, the rest of us did. The rest <laughs> of us did. He believed it, so we started to believe it. And, and, and you know, I'd move Ray Robinson up to the top, and for many reasons, but the man was flawless. I mean, there was nothing he couldn't do. I once saw him throw a knockout punch going backwards. Going backwards. Which is like That's Nolan Ryan. That's almost impossible. That's almost it's impossible. It's like Nolan Ryan throwing a fastball falling to second mm -hmm. base. And, 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 and why don't you explain to the audience out there who's a lot younger than we are about Willie Pep and why this guy was such a great boxer? If you like ballet... Willie Pep yeah. painted canvases with balletic moves. He was Picasso. He was Rembrandt. He was everything you ever wanted to see. And he had 
I think half his fights were knockouts, and they probably happened because the, the opponent fell down out of exhaustion trying to find him. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. would wind up behind him, tapping him on the shoulder to show him where he was. Yeah, he, he could get away from pe from people much, much stronger than he was. He was sadly, a moonbeam. He yeah. was a moonbeam. Yeah. Yeah. And at, at its best, you understand, boxing is brutal, at its, at, 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 but it's balletic. He was balletic and rarely brutal, but he was beautiful. Ray Robinson's number one, I think we both agree. Yes, I agree with Flawless, that. Flawless, could throw that. a knockout punch going backwards, which is like Nolan Ryan throwing a fastball falling to second and base. And could box as well as throw a knockout punches. Oh, and punch defensively. And the one, while we've got Willie Pep as number three, balletic, beautiful, Henry Armstrong, number two. Here is a man who Three titles, simultaneously. Henry Armstrong was brilliant, and when he fought for the fourth title, holding three, featherweight, lightweight, welterweight, it was a done deal. He was fighting middleweight. If he didn't knock out Seferino Garcia, it was a draw. He didn't, it was, or he'd have held half then of all the titles. Now that the second guessers have had their say, it's time to see how you, the fan, voted on Sports Nation on ESPN.com for the best boxers of all time. Number five, Joe Frazier. Number four, Marvin Hagler. Number three, Sugar Ray Robinson. Number two, Joe Lewis. Number one, Muhammad Ali. So that's it for this edition of Who's Number One? I'm Trey Wingo, and thanks for joining us for ESPN Classics ranking of the 20 best boxers of all time. We will be back to continue our countdown of the teams, the athletes, and the events that have shaped our world of sports. Until then, let the debating begin.